the Cyclopses that are in the building, bless you to all, the, all of my leaders, to all of my subscribers, um, to all of my members. Thank you very much for staying in touch with me and staying on my side to all those who come and, and frequent uh, the spiel to listen. Couldn't do without you, baby. Listen to me. As I, as I start and, and, and dive into this scenario with uh, a different background and a different, a different uh, perspective for you to see, black culture creates culture, but it's still not world culture. Can I say it again? Black culture creates culture, but it's still not world culture. Let me explain that. Let me tell you why it's a problem. Let me tell you why it's an issue. Let me tell you why it's, uh, it, it's problematic. Um, and, and always, as usual, I am speaking uh, first and foremost to my brothers in the United States of America. Um, there, if there's any culprit guilty of creating culture, it is the African in America. You are culture creators, music, orators, movements, um, entertainment, which I'm going to go with for the most part, is what black culture essentially is in America. And don't forget sports, which is inclusive of entertainment. You have, you have lost your orators. Your, your, your men who are, have the capacity to change the narrative of culture with a sentence, you have lost those people. And what you are stuck with is you are stuck with entertainer spokes models and spokespeople. And also, and it's, 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 it's me crucifying myself, the podcaster. Those are your new voices black America. Those are your new leaders. And um, what we tell you, what we talk about, what we do has become your culture. Yet, that is not world culture. So, Cat Williams broke the internet. Who is Cat Williams? He's a comedian. What was he discussing? Other comedians. He was discussing the microcosm of a comic, a person who makes people laugh in America. And he broke the internet. And, that, and people became obsessed and caught up with that particular culture. What was going on in the backdrop while Cat Williams was breaking the internet on Shannon Sharp show, another black entertainer, athlete, creating again culture, narratives, uh, comedy, entertainment, generating millions of dollars, but still not even affecting a ripple effect, a drop of a ripple effect on the world scale. Because Cat Williams has been sent for, assigned to the distraction of black people so that they do not speak to or, or, or strategize on actually real world issues. And you might think that these things are, you know, the same old rhetoric, but you have to look a little deeper at what is going on with black culture. What is going on in the background? Well, Cat Williams was talking about all of the individuals in the comedy world that he was talking about. Massive things. There's, there's world uprisings taking place in the background. There's ICJ trials taking place in the background. There's people making real moves in the world taking place in the background, things that would affect the future of your world taking place in the background. For example, currently, the new narrative, for those who are listening, that you are going to hear, go on CNN. CNN is the, one of the best places to hear American propaganda released from the military in the White House. All right? You will know what America wants to do by listening to the, the, the sound bites planted into the propaganda machine of American mainstream media, for example, one of them is CNN. 
Um, the, the catch word, you're going to hear it, <clears throat> Iranian proxies. Iranian proxies. I'll say it again for you. Iranian proxies. An Iranian proxy are militia forces that attack either Israel or American or allied bases in their own countries, of course, um, and are being called Iranian proxies. What is a proxy? A proxy is a military group paid for by another nation or another group. So if I send you to go shoot somebody, you're acting as a proxy for me. You don't have an issue with the person. I have an issue with the person. And I sent you as my proxy. And so what they're referring to are any militia forces that would, op that would oppose America. And they're referring to them as Iranian proxies. They don't even have evidence, for the most part. A lot of times they call it intel. But they are referring to them as Iranian proxies. This is a catch term that is going to form action that is going to form a new world. To start off with. Why? Because there is an intention to relieve the world of Iran. This intention doesn't begin in America, it begins in Israel, but this intention um, will potentially be backed by America. Right? Good day to you too, Brian Holmes, and to Yvonne. Good, good evening. Why am I talking about this? Because there seems to be a massive disconnect between what we in the black community are talking about and what the greater world is talking about. There's a massive disconnect. If your house is burning down and I call you and I say to you, hey, your house is burning down. You say, boy, well, you called just in time, brother. There's this show coming on television, man. You got to turn your channel. Turn your channel and watch the show. I'll say, brother, your house is burning down, though. Man, I ain't worried about that right now, man. This show is coming on. We can't miss this. That's what's happening with us. The world could be burning down around you, and, and the black community is only focused on what is taking place within our community. We are worried about who is T.D. Jakes sleeping with? Who is Puff Daddy sleeping with? We are worried about how much money is Oprah paying to Rajay P., we are worried about who is Jamal Bryant sleeping with and who is this person sleeping with. Until T.D. Jakes was affiliated in the mass media with, with Puff Diddy, Puff Daddy, whatever he wants to call himself, Sean Combs, nobody knew, white people, white people didn't know about T.D. Jakes. White people on a massive scale had no idea who T.D. Jakes was. We knew who he was. We've known who T.D. Jakes was. And this is another thing. When the black man cannot persevere the field of entertainment or, or, or sports, again, we, we challenge religion. We want, to, we want to affect and change the world religion. There are many, many, many rich and famous black preachers who they, they, they are well-known in the church sector. They're well-known in the black community. But on the, on the mass scale of the world, nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows who they are. And these are the conversations that black people need to have so that you understand when Taraj P is told, hey, you can only get 150000 for this movie. It's because you do not have mass appeal. You are a big fish in a dark pond called the black community. And we don't understand that it is very few black people, very few, there are not, I'm not saying it's completely, we're, we're completely out of play, but there are very few black people playing chess on the world scale, making pieces move. Very few that have the capacity to actually speak to and actually change world events. Very few. They're, they're very few. We have this overemphasized uh, mentality uh, of, of the relevant power of certain black people. We think Tyler Perry is a mover and shaker. We think, we think he makes things happen. We, we, we even think Michael Jordan is a mover and shaker. We think LeBron is a mover and shaker. 
right? These people are still employees. These people are still very well-fed Negroes. And they cannot affect world policy. They cannot move world policy one iota. Not one inch can they move it in America. In America. And it is crazy to think that in America there are no black world leaders that can get on their soapbox and literally change policy. None. You don't have one. You don't have, a, you don't have any. You don't have any. South Africa demonstrated to the world that South Africa and the blacks in South Africa have a louder voice than black people in America. You, you can fight me if you want to, but South Africa let you know and serve a death blow, a black eye, to this Western imperial power called the Israeli. So what does that have to say about black people in America? Could black people in America as a collective group, if every single one of you was actually in line, could you have brought a case to the ICJ against Israel? What mechanism would you have used? What would you have used to do so? So this is, this is the problem. Even if you wanted to cross over, you don't have a bridge nor a canoe to row in as a collective unit or collective group. You don't have a leader who can say, this is what the black community is looking for. South Africa could speak as one man and say, South Africa accuses you of genocide, of operating outside of the Articles 2 and Article, and Article 9 and Article 3, I believe, of, of UN dictates. And we are caught in a, in a whirlwind of our own domestic issues. And let me tell you something, it's, it's, quite, it's quite perplexing because some of our domestic issues are financially um, heavy. They're, they're big issues. Some are, some are fantastic financial windfalls, but still not affecting the world scale. And the, and the question for the black person is that when are you going to collectively change that? And I, I guess you've been asked that question for, ver for a very long time. For a very long time. In fact, the only time black people are given a true voice in America is when you are piggybacking on some obscure regime. If the, if the LGBTQ wanted a face, they would choose a black face to say what they wanted to say. Every time white supremacy wants to show black people that you are not all complicit to the empowerment and the, and the, and the uplifting of your people, they choose a black face to speak these things. And you can find these, these Negroes and these Uncle Toms who are doing those things. I don't have to, I don't have to say their name on social media for, to make them famous, more famous, but they're well known. My, my particular scenario here in Canada is that there is no black community in Canada for a very specific reason and white people show me things to discount many of the things I say because they show me black people doing the opposite of what I say. Why is there no black community in Canada? I'll tell you why. It's very simple and it's very, tra it's very tragic. There's no black community in Canada because we have no internationally known entertainer athlete um, yeah entertainer or athlete that's all I need to go into music or whatever right uh, the biggest entertainer in Canada is Drake and he's not black <laughs> he's not black at all I don't know why we, I don't know why we're we're hanging our head on an Arab uh, guy who's who's part Jewish but he's not black he doesn't I, he doesn't identify that way and so he's he is not he is not the the de facto leader of the black community in Canada, nor has he nor does he choose to be that person because he is effectively not functioning in a as a black person. If he identified that way, 
in a way that was more than simply just absconding with certain catchphrases and culture from Toronto. It would be more than that. But to me, I don't identify him as a member. I identify him as part of the, the, the overall culture. But I, I, can't, I won't stand behind Drake and say, power to the people. Thank you, Drake, for leading me. That's not, that's not what he represents. And so if Drake is all you have, who comes behind Drake? And that's what I'm saying. You, the black community is only led by entertainers and athletes. Without entertainers and athletes, even in America, you wouldn't exist. You have, so, you have so very few pundits who have the capacity to sit there and actually examine and dissect and analyze world issues. And when they do it, you think, oh my gosh. But it, no, it's because they're actually paying attention to the greater scheme of what's happening. They're actually seeing that the house is burning down. And they're addressing the fact that the house is burning down. How is the house burning down? Why is the house burning down? Who lit the fire? And why are we, I'm just saying, why are you sitting in the house? And we have too many, I believe, individuals that are very focused on keeping us um, essentially myopic towards our own dysfunctions in America, North America. Much too focused on that. Much too focused on that. You think to yourself, who is alive? Who is alive to this day? I just had a, a conversation with Dr. Brereton, my daughter. Who is alive today? that you can say and point to and say, this man speaks for black America. You could have done it in the 60s. You can't do it now. You don't, you don't know who to talk about. You don't know who to call. And guess what? Even if you did find somebody who, like, who was like that, who knows of them, male or female, who knows of them? You don't have any Shirley Chisholm's running around, Angela Davis's running around. You don't have any Stokely Carmichael's running around. Who are they? Because even if you say this guy spoke like Stokely, this woman sounds like Angela, nobody knows who she is. Because, the, and, and this, is, this, is, this is not even a crutch anymore, the mass media has not carried that voice to the top. You don't need the mass media anymore. You can create your own media now. You can't blame the mass media anymore. We are only listening for feel-good things. We are only focused on feel-good things in North America. In North America. Who is your... You don't even have Malimas in America. And Malima is not even my favorite South African politician. You don't have individuals on that level. We don't even know what side to stand on in particular issues. You don't know... You don't know if you're pro-Palestine or pro-Israel. Most of you don't know. Most of you don't know. And most of you don't know why you should be on one side or another. Most of you haven't done your, your research to even have an opinion. And it's a shame. It's a shame. It's really a shame. Because you're a migrant population sitting there in the background while other people are making decisions about your life and your livelihood. And it's a shame. One of the biggest mistakes that black people make in my city, in my universe here, this micro this microverse, is they don't they ignore the power of voting. So they don't live within the same riding groups. They don't black people don't think here, oh I'm gonna move over there where other black people are so that we have the power to to vote in our own trustee, our own um, our own city councillor. Shoot, we don't we don't have the, the, the overall voting power to vote in our own dog catcher. Because, because we don't have neighborhoods. We don't have black neighborhoods that are affluent neighborhoods here. We don't. And even the ones that are affluent, they don't look affluent. We have an area here in Oakwood and Eglinton. They used, to, they used to want to try to call it Little Jamaica, but if you're not Jamaican, that doesn't resonate with you. That was a a conclusion of the ignorant or of the, of the few. And I took my daughters there because they, they make food late. And we went there at about 10 o'clock at night. And my daughters had asked me, in front of other black people who were there buying chicken, my youngest at the time, I think she was nine. She says, Daddy, is this the ghetto? <laughs> A testament to how she was raised. She was raised in an area, right? in a, a community called Brampton. 
Brampton, and one of the main reasons I moved to that area, is because black people were settling there, buying houses, middle class, upper middles were buying houses in, black, in, in Brampton. And I thought to myself, the house is cheap, there's a black community out here, but the black community did not organize itself as quickly and as politically as the Indian community. So brown and black people living in the same overall community, but the community politically and the merchants of the community are controlled are, are Asian, meaning Indian, brown people, right? Because we didn't mobilize like that. We came for the chief house, but we didn't think of the political ramifications of not just getting a house. How about running an, uh, uh, a minister of uh, provincial parliament or a minister of parliament? How about running a guy as a city councilor or a mayor? We didn't do that. They did that, though. So my, my daughter says, Daddy, is this, is this the ghetto? And people, you know, turn. I said, my, my daughter, this is not the ghetto. This is the mecca of black industry. This man has been here since I've been in high school, turning that chicken. He's an, he is an institution. Look at all these black businesses, back to back to back. You've got a hairdresser over there. You've got another hairdresser. You've got a barbershop over there. You've got a tech place over there, right? Restaurants over here. This is the mecca of black business. This is not ghetto. So when you see, and I had to tell her, when you see black people collectively together doing business, that's not a ghetto. That's a marketplace of black business. And in Toronto, this happens to be one of them. And, in, and it's a very small strip. It's about 50 meters. <laughs> it's about 50 meters from end to end. And then, you know, other businesses take their place. But we just collectively put ourselves in that particular area. And m many businesses have been operating there for a very long time. Now, would you think that that area is an area that controls the vote? It doesn't. It doesn't. The individuals that run that area are not black, unfortunately. I, I saw a brother run for council. I was in the barbershop, and the brother was running for council. Had his picture up there, running for council. So things are trying to happen. People are trying to make that happen, but it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened on a grandiose scale. And this is the hard part. We won't support our own. We won't look at that brother and say, we, we will look at that brother. Actually, this is what we'll do. We'll look at that brother and say, oh, well, I ain't just going to vote for somebody just because he's black. I want to know what he's got to say. But you're not saying that about the white guy you're going to vote for next week. You're going to say, oh, I vote PC all the time. You're not going to check him out. But you're going to, you're going to overanalyze your own. This is us. This is what we do. This is how we think. This is how we manage situations. And it's, it's, it's a problem. Because when you are a culture creator, you can be an individual that is cryptic in how you do it. Music has changed. Back in the day, you wanted to program the culture with your music. You wanted to send subliminal messages with your music. These, these, these young black cats ain't doing that now. What are they sending? What subliminals are they sending other than, than, than the self-genocide of, our, of ourselves, other than the de-emasculation or, 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 or you know, saying things that are extremely negative towards women? What are we saying? Drug culture. What are we saying? We're not programming a culture for empowerment. We're not doing that with our music. We're not doing that with our movies. We're not. I tell my children all the time, you see all these black movies on Tubi? Watch them. These are black filmmakers. But do you think I can go on there and try to find a decent Tubi movie that I could actually sit down with my family to watch? Why are you Negroes only making horror, black horror movies? I don't want to see Black Count Chocula. I don't want to see that. Cat Williams was in some Dracula movie. Wonderful. Put something on there that I can sit down with my children and be inspired with. Please, because I'm trying to watch the movie. I go through my Android box. Yeah, I got a bootleg Android box. I go through the Android box, right, because I don't want to pay cable. And I'm trying to find a black movie. And they're like, Dad, we're always trying to find these black movies. Can't we just watch a good movie? Ah, why is it not a good movie? Because it's a black movie. Oh, Dad, it doesn't have five stars. Ah, do you think they're going to give our movies five stars? Come on. Stop it. We must be individuals that speak to the macro culture. I'm telling you, 
it's it's something happening now in this world that we're not we got we're gonna miss we're gonna miss a shift taking place. I'm telling you, there's now an American agenda, and they say, oh, it's it's not really happening. I don't think America's gonna go hard into the into the region. America and Israel are trying to move their agenda towards the eradication of Iran. That means a couple of major things are going to happen. Number one, never before, and I spoke about this a few days ago, you can check it out um, online, speaking of um, the mercenaries that are for sale, never before is being an actual mercenary going to be a, a particular profession of the future. Mercenaries are professions of the future. And this is going to be interesting, watch this, as I take my sip. Once you have private military companies, PMCs, they're called. Now, let me tell you something. Those are, the, those are the future billionaires. PMCs. Private military corporations. A private military corporation is, are guys who are professional soldiers who have now said they're going to make themselves private guys for hire. And once you have individuals where, where there's world issues happening and you have people like iran and the uae and saudi arabia who are going to financially pay for for seasoned soldiers guys who know what they're doing guys who've been trained in america trained in england guys who know trained in canada you're going to have the weirdest war in the this was going to be a war of of the same individuals fighting watch if you're going to pay me a million and a half dollars to go work for Hezbollah, I'm, I'm not talking about myself. Let me make sure I'm, I'm not putting myself in the position because Hezbollah, I don't have the skills to work with you. But if you think that white soldiers from England, from Britain, from anywhere in the world are not going to take a million dollars to fly somewhere into the Middle East and be tra train a bunch of Hezbollah soldiers and then fly back, you, and you think they're not going to do that, you got another thing coming. you got another thing coming. ISIS, when we, we, when we first were introduced to ISIS, you know what we're shocked about? How does this guy who speaks for ISIS have such a great British accent? You think he learned that British accent? You think he learned that British accent in the Middle East? You're going to have private military corporation companies working in a cold war fashion bringing iran and other agents proxies rather in the in the area up to spec on american and israeli military you're going to do it people are going to do it because a soldier is not political this is what people don't understand a soldier a pmc specifically he's not political he doesn't care who he kills he care who pays him to kill who he kills he doesn't care who he kills. He doesn't care that he's getting, he cares he's getting paid to do a job. He's going to do a job and leave. And now you've got America positioning themselves next to Israel to, to go after Iran. They're not going to go after Iran directly. First, they're going to pepper you with this wording, Iranian proxies, Iranian proxies, Iranian proxies. Every time America, this, this American base was... Oh, this is another thing. Drones were used on an American base. Oh, I thought America and Israel only had drones. No, everybody's got drones. Because people are going to buy their drones from Russia. They're going to buy their drones from China. They're going to buy their, their drones from, from Iran. And you're going to have a scenario where everybody has drones, everybody has great technology, and the guy with the best technology wins. And if you know that you can create a fantastic drone... Guess what? Every, and you want to sell it? You're not, you don't care who buys it. You're not a nationalist. They're not building nationalism anymore. Nationalism doesn't exist. You, et, nationalism ends when you finish standing for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the national anthem at a basketball game. Your nationalism is over. And some of you don't even stand in. So this scenario where we are believing that people are simply going to say, oh, I'm an American. I would never go over there and fight and fight with Hezbollah and fight with those hooties. That's not going to happen. They're going to go. They're going to go. They're going to say, oh, it's okay. We're going to, 
you know, we're going to do our training in the UAE, so come to Dubai. You don't have to fly over here. You can come. We're going to do our training in Dubai. Dubai's going to let us train. Come to Egypt. We're going to do our training in Egypt. So they're going to they're going to they're going to let you come to a place that you're allowed to go to and you're going to do you're going to train people that you don't know who they are and you're going to and you're going to leave with your money. Arms dealers. I wish I could invest in them right now. Arms dealing. Imagine the money those guys are making right now. Imagine the black market arms dealers who work for China, who the Chinese government has released to get arms to all of these anti-American proxies, so-called proxies. They're going to they're gonna call every single solitary um, rebel force a proxy. And none of these people are putting up their hands saying, I, I did it, I did it, I blew up three Americans. We did it over here, kill us. <laughs> When America, when America slash CNN is telling us, oh yeah, we know who did it and uh, they've taken responsibility and uh, we're going to strike back. Who is sitting there telling, telling people, yeah, you know, we just blew you guys up. It's us. Come on, man. That's propaganda. They, they have an intention to kill those people. They have either attacked that base themselves or they reported that the base has been attacked and because their intention is to get consensus to go over there and do what they want to do period period and they're going to kill anybody who gets in their doggone way that's why me i'm not going to be calling stuff out too much huh i'm not dying for any cause the only cause i would die for is my children because i'm, I'm just reporting how it's going to happen but we are going to sit back and keep bouncing basketballs, dunking, singing, telling jokes, and it's all going to pass by us. And the new regime is going to come in and say, okay, you blacks, just keep on dancing. Just keep it going. We like what you're doing. Just keep on singing. But, but how are you going to get your piece of the world? This is my question to you. How are you going to get your self-governance? How are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? Are you going to say, we are going to be more community-minded? We are going to be more military-minded? We have to. We absolutely have to. We are going to say that we need a regiment that is assigned to areas like Atlanta and, and, and Houston. And these big, we need to make sure that our militia groups are, are, are positioned and in place and ready. We need to make sure that we own our own banks and we, we have our own engineers and we have our own technological savvy guys who can do coding. We have to make sure we have our own drone companies and our own uh, arms dealers ourselves because we will be cut out of this thing. Listen, when American black people start thinking like they're building a nation, that's when, that's when true progress will happen. And it's not, it cannot be any more dangerous for you than it's already been. Can't be. I think white people, I think America has, is waiting for you to say, let me step up to the plate and actually become a statesman. Let me step on the plate and actually become an individual who's actually going to run my country. Actually do it. We have people here. The, the, the biggest person here is a woman. Dr. Leslie Lewis is probably the only black person here who has stuck her neck out and said, let me, let me defy what the status quo is saying. I'm not, oh, I don't agree with what you did with COVID. I don't agree with your vaccine. Uh, I don't agree with giving the World Health Organization the, the carte blanche on dictating to Canada what is, a, what is an epidemic, what is a pandemic. No, 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 no. We're an independent, sovereign nation. We're going to make our own decisions. She's the only one speaking like that. But she still has to be careful because she still has to work within the confines of her party. She doesn't want to be a backbencher. She wants to be part of the solution. But other than her... I don't know any Canadian black politician who's worth their salt. And the same goes for America. We're in that place. We're in that place. And so black culture has to become world culture. Black culture, when you get sucked in to saying, wait a minute, I've only been, I've only been watching what's, what's been taking place here uh, between, between uh, you know, Kevin Hart and and, and I, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's going on in the world scale? 
When's the last time you guys have actually watched world news? I know the people on this channel, for the most part, you're conscientious. But in general, speaking across the board, sometimes the things we do don't even make sense. Some, uh, and, and, and it's because we're ignorant. When, are you gonna, you, I'm going I'm to hurt your feelings. Some of, one, one of the most ignorant things that, that bothers me, you guys aren't going to like this at all. <clears throat> Hebrews lights. I got to talk to you. When I see the Hebrew Israelites preaching, and they say, the only Israelites are blacks and Latinos. <laughs> I think to myself, like, ling linguistically, that doesn't even make sense. Right? It doesn't even make sense. A Latin, a Latin is not, an, is not a Hebrew. It's blacks and Latino, the indigenous Latino, he, the, the indigenous Indian, those are the only Israelites, or blacks and Latinos. If, even if you said the indigenous of North America and South America, we've identified their groupings as being individuals who are connected to the ten tribes, which is what they're trying to say. To refer to them as Latinos or Latinas absolutely disqualifies them from being what you're claiming them to be linguistically because how can you be a latin which is a white person right a latin is a white person every time without without change he is a roman of the band of the band of italy of, of the spaniards of the franks of uh, he is he is either germanic or, or potentially slavic to be to be that coming into that grouping, but Slavics are not Latins, but to be Latin automatically means you are not Hebraic. So to say that the only Israelite who is a Semitic Hebraic human is a Latin is oxymoronic. And it's an incapacity to see the linguistic con conundrum that upsets me. And so in, your, in, in, in our zeal to be right, we find ourselves speaking wrong. How can a Latin be, in, be Hebraic? And how can now you claim that they are part of the ten tribes because they are now the indigenous Indian and you've just... But I don't care if you said that the indigenous Indian somehow is a, is a Hebrew. But how can a Hebrew be a Latin? That's your problem. The, word, the wording is wrong. And this is the problem, I believe, with the massive um, brain trust of what it means to understand the world. When you don't understand the world, you just say things that make no sense. Man, that's one of my pet peeves. I don't like to listen to stuff that doesn't make no sense. You can't say it. You cannot say a Latin is a Hebrew. Doesn't make sense. Does not make sense. La you can't say they're Latinos or Latinas. The you can say the individuals, and, and, and this is the funny part too. The reason that those natives are being identified as Latinos is because Latins took them over, right? Portugal, Spain came, settled in the regions where they were indigenous, force them to learn those languages. That's what you're saying, right? Good. You are not saying that the Afro-Latino, the Africans who speak Hispanic or speak Portuguese, you're not talking about them because they're inclusive of blacks. You already included them in the blacks. You're speaking specifically to those who are non African, who are non-melanated, deeply melanated, and you are assigning them Hebraic assignment by referring to them as Latins. This is a problem. This is an anthropological problem. This is anthropology. It cannot work. You have to stop calling them Latinos. And you have to say the indigenous of, Amer of the Americas we have identified as Hebrews. You can't say a Latin is a Hebrew. I don't care, I don't care if we're supposed to just figure it out for you 
You can't say a Latin is a Hebrew. It shows your myopic misunderstanding of the world's anthropology. It shows that you're, you're paying too much attention to the block and you're not paying enough attention to what's taking place in the world. It doesn't make sense. Understand. I have no issue if you somehow have decided and found some correlation between the indigenous South African, South American, North American, and the missing link of who the other tribes are. I have no issue. But when you call them a Latin, you've disqualified them from being a Hebrew. Do you get what I'm saying to you, brothers? This is not me coming for you. It's me trying to fix your jargon. It doesn't make sense. If it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense. You understand what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. This is why it's so easy for me to identify myself as a Christian. It's easy for me to do it. It's easy for me because now when I look at the indigenous Christianity, primitive Christian, primitive Christianity must be African because primitive Christianity came from predominantly scholars of Africa, Egypt, referred to as Alexandria. Primitive Africans were part of the individuals who, who constructed, sorry, the primitive church that is African. The primitive church that is African was part of the fundamental formation of creedal language and thought in the church. The dominant thinker of the second century, of the third century, of the fourth century, in respect to Christendom, was the African. Who was this African? This was an African that wasn't just simply an African. He was an African that had moved from some of the other areas because of the Roman blow up of the Jew. And this African was predominantly individuals who came from a Hebraic background. The Indian, because we know that, that uh, the Apostle Thomas planted churches in India, and we know the original apostles were he Afro-Semitic, Afro-Hebraic men, and they moved to India. That's why India was used to be called Eastern Ethiopia, and there's a black presence in India. You see, when you study these things, you can't make mistakes with your mouth because my brain is bigger than my street. doesn't make sense it doesn't make dollars and it's got to make sense it's got to make sense got some goa rockercy and guapatism give me <laughs> what's guapatism <laughs> uh guapatism you tell me what they mean i'm gonna write them down i'm, I'm gonna remember them let me look them up right now for you man said guapatism it looked like moneyatism I'm 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 gonna Google guapatism. Guapatism. <laughs> Is that a real word I'm, I'm looking for? Or am I fooling myself? Guapatism. No, it ain't. <laughs> it looked like what it looked like. You know. It looked like what it looked like. Guapatism, but I it seemed like what it is. It's guapatism. It's it's moneyatism. But if you have an actual meaning for that word, please let us know. But again, my 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 pre predominant issue is when we dive into um, tribal battles and miss the global situation. We miss the global um, meaning of the invasion of our culture. We run into the same thing that, that, that took place in the Middle Passage. Right? We, have, we had tribal battles. We had tribal issues. I'm going to show you one of my... This is the cloth that I have that I got from Ghana. And speaking of the tribal scenario, beautiful cloth. I made shorts out of it. But I have it now as a spread on my table. And these things remind me of some of the tribal battles that we've had. I've had a tribal battle with you. <laughs> I, thought I, I, thought, I thought so. <laughs> I had a tribal battle with you. And in the tribal battle, I, I was able 
to take your little brother hostage. And I had your little brother hostage here, but because I am I have an affinity towards my enemy that looks like me. All I had your little brother do was like cutting wood. He was here to keep you in line. Don't act up here. I got your little brother over here. He's okay. He's well fed. In fact, what I might do is let him grow up and then let him marry my daughter and then send him back to you so you can't have no, no beef. But when the European comes now and sees my tribal skirmishes, they say, hey, who is that? That's uh, a prisoner of tribal here. He's, he's, he's here, he's doing the work he's supposed to be doing. Eventually he'll marry my daughter, I'll send him back, and then they won't have any problems back and forth. And the European says, wait, wait, wait. Why don't you give him to me? No, 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 no. He's, he's, he's almost family now. Now, I'll give you some guns. Give you some whiskey. Because I don't need gold, I'm in Ghana. I mean, I, I don't need gold. I'll, I'll give you some technology. I'll give you some things that you can't get on your own. Oh, for him? What are you going to do with him? Ah, he's going to come over here and do the same thing he's doing with you for me. Take him. Now, my global mind does not understand what this man is doing. This man has just bought a human being, given me something as an asset. He's not, he's not, he's not, I don't have that level of relationship that I need to worry about him that much. And then I realize, I like what this man has given me. I have more like him. Do you want more? Yeah, I want more. Do you have any that are bigger and stronger? Oh, yeah. But the price will change, my friend. I'll need five guns for, for that, for the next one you get. No problem. All of a sudden now, my tribal mentality has me selling my brother up the river. And haven't we been, still been doing it? Haven't we still been doing it? Selling our people up the river. You still do it in the music business. You're still selling each other up the river. You're still doing it even in the mortgage business. We had a, we had a very big mortgage company in this city. I don't know if I want to want to say their name. But the black the young black guy he was doing well. He was taking over. And um a lot of black people were going to work for me. And at the time I had my license, he asked me to work for him. But I don't, I don't move quick. For those who don't understand how mortgages work as an agent, you go out and hunt, your, you hunt the food, you get the deal. Your license is with your brokerage. The brokerage picks up a percentage, 10%. So at the time, I was demanding 90% of my commission. I would have to go work with him. I might have to give up a little, another 10%. I might have been 80, 20. Eh, it wasn't worth it to me. I'm, I'm fine where I am. But other individuals getting into the business, you know, he was, you can come in anywhere between 50% to 80%. But the problem that we have in our community is greed. And I'm not saying that this brother would do it by himself, but I would do deals. I bring the deal to the table. I've got some of the money. And usually this worked the other way around. But usually actually is how it really worked. But I'll, I'll give it, I'll reverse it. And I need another guy who's got a secondary private lender to finish my deal so I can close my deal. Now, I need you. He doesn't necessarily need me. I need him to close my deal. So what does he want to do? He wants to steal my share of the deal because I've got the first, which is the bigger portion, and he's got the second. But if he can do the whole deal himself, hey, so he'll now get me, telling me, tell my people, yeah, you know what, I got the second, it's going to be fine, you're not going to deal with any penalties, and then he'll say, oh man, I got a problem with my lender. What's the problem? He doesn't want to do it, man. I'm sorry, bro. This deal's going to be dead. I'm sorry. Now, in the meantime, he has gathered all the information of, from my client. He has their information. He has all everything that they have. I've got to kill the deal in my hands because I can't get it done. And my clients go away. 
unhappy. This is, I'm, I'm, I'm fast forwarding. Of course, I would try other privates and see. But essentially, this is what they do. The deal dies in, the, in my hands. And then he, who actually does have a deal with his private lender, will call my client back and say, hey, listen, I, I made something happen for you guys. Um, if you're willing to leave Dell, I can make this deal happen for you. But, you know, he can't know anything about it. And he just stole the deal out from under you, baby. We do that to ourselves, even in this city. Stuff like that happens all the time. All the time. We are constantly in tribal wars with each other, but don't understand the bigger picture. What is the bigger picture of that just analogy? The bigger picture is, brother, me and you can do even more business. You have no idea of my network. You stole one little deal because you're greedy. I could have bringing I could have been bringing you five deals a week. I could have been bringing you twenty thousand dollars a week of deals in your commission, but you wanted to steal that one. You wanted to sell that one little slave. You wanted to have that one little moment on Shannon Sharp's couch. You want to have your one little opportunity to let them to stick it to your brother. But you're not doing anything on the world scheme. You're not shaking him. I, I don't believe, and speaking about Cat Williams again, I don't believe that any big movie people called Cat after that interview and said, Cat, we got we to gotta do something big with you. We'll see. I don't think he endeared himself to any grander purpose. I don't think. Will we watch his, net, his next Netflix special? Yes, we will. <laughs> yes, we will. But at what cost? This is the question. And I'm kind of sick and tired that the cost of black promotion is the crushing of other black skulls. That's my issue. That's my problem. And the secondary situation is that when you step higher, are you stepping higher to see the world? Are you stepping higher just to see your own neighborhood? And this is the problem that we must have with each other. We have to be able to look further. I'm done. Thank you very much for your time. Bless you. Have an amazing evening and night. Thank you very much, Yvonne. I saw your, I saw your gift of $20. Bless you. Thank you very much. Haiti 19, 1804, God bless you. Everybody else who's came on here. And to those who hung around, I appreciate you. 52 minutes is too long to talk about something I could have talked about in 10. But I want to keep stay here and talk with you. God bless you until I speak again. Share this. Become a, um, a member of the channel. Join. Become a member. Become um, one of the subscribers. There's benefits in membership. There's uh, Depending on what membership you purchase, there's various different benefits. There's uh, merchandise that we have. There's a lot of things that's going on in the spiel. And I'm hoping that... This podcast can become something that allows people in the future to say, this is where I formulated my thought on this particular idea or issue. So share it with your friends. Talk about it at, at, at dinner time. And let's make sure that we, we are changing the world one sentence at a time. Okay? God bless you.